<laughs> okay, ready? Yep. Now, does anybody know who that person is right there? The dancing goat. Does anybody know who that is? Anybody? Nobody? Does anybody know who that is? Does anybody know who that is? Yeah. Uh -oh. Who's that? Cardinals. Anybody know who that is? Anybody know who that is? Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Anybody know who that is? Anybody know who that is? Okay, so who in it, which pitcher would in the Hall of Fame this week? Mussini. Mussina. Mike Mussina. And Mariano Rivera. Mariano Rivera. And when Mariano Rivera was there, he said, Gracia a Dios por él. Porque si yo no tengo él, yo no tengo la, no donde está mal. If I don't have Mel Stoudemire as my pitching coach, I do not go to the Hall of Fame. These are the best pitching coaches that have lived. Johnny Sane is the number one pitching coach. Tom House is the smartest pitching coach. George Bam Garrett, Duncan Mazzoni, these guys have all three, four, five, six, seven Hall of Fame pitchers below them. As a student, what I would recommend that you do as a coach is I would study the way they teach. Okay, so now when we throw a baseball, there's three things that happens with the ball. It moves through space at a certain speed. It goes to a certain location, and on the way it has certain movement characteristics. There's only three things. So the curveball has its speed, it has its location, and it has its movement pattern. The fastball has its movement patterns, its location, and its velo. As a pitcher, Xavier, as a pitcher in a game situation, what is the most valuable thing that you can have of these three? Location. Xavier goes with location. What's the most valuable thing we could have? Yeah. Huh? Location. Location. Okay, and you wanna I said B low. You're gonna go what? B low. Which one? B low? Yeah. You're gonna go with B low? Okay, you're gonna go with B low. Anybody else? Uh that was a little so uh movimiento. He said the movement. Okay, so you're gonna become a student of the game, but the student of the game you're gonna have knowledge. We want you to have correct knowledge. There is nothing more important than movement. Everybody's chasing velo, and then we're going to try to get location. But if you throw a 94 mile an hour ball on the middle, in the middle half, outside the middle half, and it doesn't move, it's moving, it's going out. It's going out. If that fastball doesn't have movement, Took the any not. You throw that ball straight and hard, oh, you make everybody happy. Your mother's happy, your father's happy. You put it on Facebook. The hitter says, yeah, baby, come on, baby, bring it. No movement. Try hitting a knuckleball at 72 miles an hour that no, nobody knows where it's going. It's got no location. Nobody knows where it's gonna land, but it has tremendous movement, so it's hard to hit. So movement is actually your most important thing. You have to develop the movement along with the location and the velo. What's the difference between control and command? Control. What's the difference? Control is all our strikes and command is that you're able to put the ball where you want to. Right, you understand what we said there? Control is with throwing strikes. Command is putting the ball exactly where we want. Okay? Now, what's the difference between a number one pitcher and a number three pitcher on a major league staff? What is the difference between one and three in Grande Leagues? The number one pitcher, he has command of maybe two or three pitches and he has control of one, two, or three pitches. The number three pitcher has control, command of one pitch, 
and control with three or four. That's the difference between your ace and your number three, number four guy. He has more command over more pitches. He has command over three or four pitches. This is important to understand, right? Okay? Now, how do we get this control? How do we get this command? How do we get this location? How do we get this movement? Where does it come from? It's not magic. Okay, one of the first things that we do when we want to establish velocity and location and movement and control and command, one of the very first things that we do as we study the history and the science of pitching is we are going to look at what you're doing and we're going to eliminate red flags. Does anybody, can everybody give me an example of a red flag? Anybody at all? Any red flags? Rojo bandanas, bandanas. No quiero bandanas rojo. No quiero. It's muy peligroso. ¿Entiende? Okay. ¿Tú tienes un ejemplo de eso? ¿Tú sabes? Anybody understand the red flag? Can anybody here tell me a red flag? Please, somebody tell me one red flag. Anybody? Do you know any red flags? That's one pressure. Hmm? A red flag in a pitcher? A red flag for a pitcher. Watching a pitcher throw, I go red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag. Okay, so since someone was saying the elbow is down. So if he sees the elbow down, that's a red flag. Anybody else? Front side opening early. Huh? Front side opening. Front side opening too early would be a red flag. Not going to the mechanics. Take his not going to the mechanics. Okay, mechanics is a little bit general, so now we're going to start getting a little bit more specific on what's happening with the mechanics. Okay? So what we're doing right now is we're looking at the biomechanical sequence, we're looking at the sequential movements of the pitcher, we're relating it back to the science of what is safe for a pitcher's arm, and what's going to create velo location, movement, control, and command. This is the package that we want. The answers are in the physics and the science, and we have to know what we're looking for. Okay, I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read to you some of the red flags. Okay, a chromial line break, backside or frontside hyperextension, inverted W, an early dynamic turn, elbow behind the wrist on forward movement. No external layback from the shoulder. This is external rotation. Sometimes we call that layback. The body runs away from the ball. No, blue, no butt drive, no glute drive. Front side opening early. No hip to shoulder angle is established because we're trying to create 38 to 42 degree angle differentiation between the hips and the shoulders. That creates power. That's where 70% of your velocity comes from. 70% of your velocity comes from what we call hip to shoulder torque differential. Okay? Forearm fly out. Elevated distal humerus. Soft front side. Glove falling out. Head falling out. Foot opening up early. Stride too short. Late turn on the stride. Offline directional forces, the vectors are going in different directions. <clears throat> Head bails out, glove throws out, no pronation, supinating when you should be pronating, pronating when you should be supinating. Premature arm stoppage, no finish on the arm. Incorrect tilt angle on the posture, body not coming through, weight not transferring from backside to front side. Shoelace is not going down in the dirt and extending at least 25% of your stride length. You have a stride length, your foot should be releasing and coming across the ground, and shoelace is now 25% down. 
You should not be get, uh, finishing torso rotation until you're 75% through your stride distance. Your stride distance should be 85 to 92% of your body height. No shoulder exchange, torso recoil, or no follow through with the upper body. Low arm cock at foot strike, and foot strike arm is low, arm is not at its apex. There are more red flags. These are just a few of them. Before we can establish a correct sequential movement, a correct biogram, we have to remove these red flags so that we can attain these things. We don't establish velocity by trying to throw harder. We don't establish command and control by just focusing on that one spot more. There's a lot more to it. Now, if you fail as a hitter, if you fail to apply the science of hitting as a hitter, you will pop up and ground out. And you will be unhappy, and you won't do well. If you fail to apply, if you fail to eliminate those red flags, and you try to pitch hard with incorrect biomechanical motions, not only will you fail, you will get injured. You will get injured. You will blow out a rotator cuff, a rotator cuff, you'll have trouble with your ulnar collateral ligaments, you'll have trouble with your labrums, you'll have trouble with your scaps. Arm injuries cost us more money than anything. The most valuable thing that you have is your arm. And that's why we spend so much time conditioning and stretching and loosening up the arms. Because we value the arms very much. You have to spend a lot of time preparing to throw a baseball. Any one throw, the arm could snap. The growth plate can go, forearm can break. Any one throw. And it can all go downhill really fast. The surest the surest probability that you will be injured a second time is when you've been injured the first time. We have to try to eliminate that first serious injury. 70, 80, 90% of the players that have the first serious injury will have a second injury. Why do guys that have rotator cuff surgery have a pretty high success of coming back strong? Maybe 70%, not everybody comes back. But why do a lot of them come back strong? So here's a left-handed pitcher. The ball's going this way. So his, his arm goes up, and his arm is back, and the ball is here. Got it? There's a the left-handed pitcher, right? He's throwing the ball in this direction. Now his body is here. That elbow is going to continue to move forward in front of his body before he throws the ball. So. This is one of my pictures right here. This is Jake Eater. Uh, I trained, well, I trained Greg since he was nine years old. Okay? So there's Jake right there, pitching in the state championship game. See the elbow? How it's flat? See the elbow? It's way back. So he's at what angle would you call that line? If we drew a line across there with reference to the ground, his body's at 90. He's about 182 degrees in that picture. Did he go further back than that? We don't know. Like that's where the camera caught him. But he certainly didn't do less, right? He certainly didn't do less. So if you take a look at that picture, see the layback there? Okay. You see that layback? See that way back? That arm has to get back. That arm's not going to get back if you're working too tight with too much weight. It's going to stiffen up. Your shoulder won't rotate properly. Okay? Now, see the elbow coming forward? See that elbow? Pass that around there if you want. Okay, ready? So we're going to talk a little bit about pitching elbow quantitative analysis. 
This is out of one of Tom House's books, one of the pitching coaches that was up there on the board. Tremendous pitching coach, okay? And he analyzed the number of pitchers. Nolan Ryan was at 196 degrees, and he was 10 inches, his elbow was 10 inches in front of the center of gravity before he threw the ball. 10 inches. Roger Clemens was at 185 degrees, 11.17 inches. Paul Hershiser was at 190 degrees, 8 inches. Uh, Kevin Brown was at 14 inches in the front, a little bit longer arms. So my arm being short, it's not going to go as far. You have a longer distance from your shoulder to your elbow, so your elbow has a, an ability to get further out. Now we're getting closer to the plate. 90 miles an hour, if I throw the ball from here at 90, and you throw the ball from here at 90, that looks like 93. Now we're changing not only the velocity, but we're changing the effective speed of the velocity to the pitcher, to the batter's eyes. The ball gets in on quicker. The same speed ball gets in on quicker. So uh, how do you get to the... To so you're, you're reducing late, later. You're getting down the line further. Your elbow is getting out in front of your body further. So these are the things that we need to work on to not only just develop more velocity, but to effectively create effective perceived velocity on the batter's side. So if we both throw the ball at 90, my ball gets there at 0.3, oh, your ball gets there at 0.26. Same speed on the gun. One batter rakes it, the next batter says, I don't know, the ball got on me fast, I can't do nothing with it. It's only 90. See the difference? Look at this picture here. The center of his body is approximately there. If we measure where his elbow is and draw a straight line down and measure that, you'll see he's 9, 10, 11 inches in front of the center of gravity. Take a look at how far up he's extending. And we, we don't, he could be extending further. You understand? Right? This arm's got to get out late. You throw the ball late. But we'll take a look at your video tape later, but you, I think you're throwing right in here. Because you have long arms and a great body, we want you 12, 13, 14 inches in front. Still holding the ball. He's in the full layback external rotation. The elbow is past the body. Most of you guys are throwing from here. No, you need to throw from here. This elbow's got to get out. So the first thing that we do is we're driving our chest forward. Now the body follows, and the elbow comes right up. We deliver the arm with the torso, not with the arm. Most of you are using some energy back here to pull the ball forward. Once you try to pull the ball forward, you're finished. You've tapped your velocity. You have no place to grow to. So when this ball comes back in here, you've got the stiff front side up in here, okay, with a short arm in here, and when we start to make this turn, the hips turn first. The lower body turns first. There's your hip to shoulder torque differential. My shoulders are here, my hips are here, my hips are opening up first. This arm stays in, it doesn't fly out. This ball is in here, and instead of me pulling the ball forward, Edwin, watch what's going to happen. I turn the hips, I turn the shoulders, and the ball drops back. The torso turns and puts the elbow in position. Now the arm goes to work. I call it throwing the ball late. If you start the throwing motion early, you've killed the action. You think it, Edwin? Yeah. Huh? Does it make sense to you? Yeah, makes sense. I see your wheels moving here. Yeah, huh? Yeah. Can you feel it? <laughs> Can you feel it back there? Huh? So, would you agree that probably when you get to this position is that you're pulling the ball forward a little bit? You feel it, Xavier? We don't want to pull the ball. The ball drops in. So you want to hold it in a little longer? The ball drops in behind your head. Look at Maddox and Clements. Look where the ball is. They've completely turned. 
The elbow is bent down. That ball is behind Maddox's head, isn't it? Look where he is. He's moving forward, and the ball is back in here. You see it? Look, look at the distance where he's at. He's disengaged from the rubber. He's six feet down the line with his stride. His front knee is completely bent. His chest is pushing to the plate. He's leading the way with his head and his chest. His elbow and ball are still way back. He's going to throw the ball late. Most pitchers are going to throw that ball back in here and bring it through. Now, if you've got a strong arm and you've got a strong body, you can get away with that until that 82, 84 miles an hour. And then the airplane don't fly any higher. You're off the runway. You're done. You've burned up your engines. You're finished. There's nothing else left. The body's not contributing anymore. It's just all arm. Can you feel me? Does this make sense? Yeah. You can't wait to get out there and try this uh, guy. Child, I, I was wondering, like, so are these guys that are getting to that spot, are they, are they like imagining themselves throwing the chest towards home plate in yeah. order to kind of like hold that ball stay back? Hold that ball back, hold it back, hold it back, let that torso go, get down the line, get down the line. Now the faster we can get down the line and the faster we can rotate the body, we yeah. create arm speed. If you bring the body down the line slow, that's going to reduce the arm speed. How do we bring our body down a hill fast, sequentially perfect, with perfect mechanics? You've got to be in really good shape. You've got to be really stretched out with yoga. Your muscles have to be ready to fire. This is why Aroldi Chapman is so successful. Joe Madden, who is the head coach for the Cubs, said he's never in all of his life seen a more flexible but strong player. Aroldi Chapman can bend his body in any direction, and when he bends it, it's a steel rebar. But he can bend it whenever he wants. He's in phenomenal condition. He's very flexible, but he's very strong. His tensile strength is really strong. So when he winds that body up, he's generating a lot of power, holding the power back, holding the power, and bang, he releases it. 102, 103, 104. So he's in tremendous condition. That's why our conditioning program here is very important. That's why you guys have to get in top shape. Okay? So that ball has to drop back. Here's your elbow moving forward after the chest. Is that the wrong? Was that the best pitcher in Major League Baseball last year? Who's that? Who's one of them? See the elbow passed? The center of gravity is here. He's got a big stride, perfect leg angle, 42 degrees, perfect posture angle, chest leading the way, glove hasn't pulled out, head going straight down the line, elbow has not released the ball yet. He's now moved from this position up to this position, and now he's going to come late. That, his elbow is 11, 12 inches past center of gravity. Most of you are 2, 3, 4, 5 inches. You need to add those extra 2 or 3 inches. I'm going to show you some pictures of pronation. Okay, pronation is nature's way of protecting the elbow. Let me repeat that. Pronation is nature's way of protecting the elbow. Take a look at what happens with the right hand who throws the ball. Thumb rotates down to the 6 o'clock position. Elbow rotates from 6 o'clock up to 3 o'clock. Elbow rotates to 3, thumb rotates to 6. Muy importante. So maybe if you're tiene un drill, solo pronación. Muy suave. Tiene un poco más duro. ¿Ok? ¿Entiende? So mira. There's your lefty. 
There's your lefty pronate. Okay? Now, look what happens when Drew Brees throws the football. When Drew Brees and Tom Brady and Mahomes throw the football, they pronate. Okay? That's nature's way of protecting the elbow. If you're not pronating, then you're not getting good spin, and you're not going to get good velocity, and you're not going to be able to control the ball. If you don't pronate the same way on your fastballs, you're going to have not have control. So each of these little pieces become an important part of the pie. So for you polish your pronation, you polish your external rotation, you polish your elbow coming forward. You work on one thing at a time. Please. Okay. We talked about external rotation. We talked a little bit about postural tilt and shoulder coming through. We talked about pronation. There are muscles that accelerate the ball, and there are muscles that decelerate the ball. The muscles that accelerate the ball are on the front side, the muscles that decelerate the ball on the back side. There are three prime muscles on the front side that accelerate, there are two muscles on the back to de decelerate. That means the acceleration muscles have an advantage over the deceleration muscles, putting pressure on the deceleration muscles, and therefore most injuries are decelerator muscles. Labs, scaps, rotator cuffs, backside shoulder. That's where you're going to get most of your injuries. All right. So you have to balance the body with your exercises so that both your accelerator muscles and your decelerator muscles are being worked out properly and you know which muscles you're working on. You're not just working on a muscle. Now you've got to do more work on your decelerators than you do the accelerators. Can you please? Okay, we're going to talk about Vectors. Does anybody there have any idea what a vector is for a pitcher? A vector. A vector is a line that we're putting energy on. Okay? So, for instance, if we were flying an airplane, and this was due north, and the airplane was here, and we wanted to go to the airport right there, this vector would be 360 degrees. That would be our vector. So we dial in the compass and we calibrate the radio equipment for 360. If we wanted to go to the airport over here and the airplane was facing this way, we would vector in 90 degrees so that we could make that right hand turn. And then we would follow that vector. Now you have primary vectors and you have secondary vectors. A vector is a path of energy. It's a path of light. When you take a flashlight and you send the beam, that's a vector. That's a vector. You with me, boys? Okay. Now, how wide is home plate? How wide is home plate? 12 inches. 12 inches. Do I hear 14? Do I hear 12? Do I hear 10? Do I hear 15? Anybody got 15? I need 14. I got 15. Anybody know? Listen, if you go to Little League, home plate, 17 inches. 17 inches. You go to high school, it's 17 inches. You go to college, it's 17 inches. When you go to the minor leagues, it's 17 inches. When you go to Major League Baseball, it's 17 inches. You need to put the ball across 17 inches no matter how old you are, no matter where you are. Everything's going to change the distance. 17 inches. That's where we're going. Got it? So, we have a very narrow target here, 60 feet away. If I take my glove, I've got primary vectors and secondary vectors. I've got primaries and secondaries. My glove is a secondary vector. That means it's not a strong vector, but it's a vector. This is my primary vector. This is my primary vector. This is my secondary vector. My foot is my secondary vector. My head is my secondary vector. If I take a secondary vector and throw it offline, it pulls the primary offline. That's opening early. If I step 
with my foot, and I open early. I've opened early with a secondary vector, it affects the primary vectors, and now the next secondary vector wants to go with it. Your job is to take your primary vectors and send it straight down the middle of that 17 inches. And if you are off by one inch on this end, and you open up one inch, that will create four to five, six inches difference at the other end. If I take a laser beam light and put it on my belly button, and I focus it on the middle of those 17 inches, that's a vector. Edwin, if I move my belly button one inch, how far do you think the laser beam came off the center of the plate? Inches lost. I'm going to move the beam one inch. That's, 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 that's quite a bit, isn't it? It's almost 18 inches. When you move your body slightly offline, you have changed everything. So your primary vectors are your butt, your hip drive. That hip drive has to go to the plate straight. You've got to land straight. Your shoulders have to be straight or cocked in. Now we're going to make our rotation. But if anything opens up early on a primary vector or a secondary vector, you're going to be offline. You need to understand. Hey coach, take a look. My hip bone's straight enough. But my head and my butt pushed out enough. Don't worry about throwing the ball. That's the last part. You with me, Edwin? This is where you're going to get to Edwin. You can throw 93, 94, you can get there. You got the body, you're strong, you're smart, you're a hard worker, you're putting in the time. You can get there. You can get there. I need you to become a student. I need you to learn this stuff with me. This is how we do it. This is the track. This is how we get to 90 plus. You put a little meat on his bones. Huh? Put a little muscle on this guy. Muscle him up. Huh? Primary movers. Primary vectors. Now, when you're looking at home plate, you're dividing home plate into at least 12 different quadrants. And you've got to know what that guy's batting average is in each quadrant. You've got to be looking at him in the on-deck circle. This guy's hitting in the three hole. That's that third baseman. Yeah, he's got a lot of power. Yeah, I've seen this guy before. Yeah, he's probably going to be a middle-in guy. Look like he's moving his feet. Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to attack him from the outside. Let's see if he can be a 220 batter or 180 batter on the outside corner. And you're thinking boxes. Which box are we going to throw into for this guy? How do we get him off balance? How do we get him to open up early? Okay? Uh, we're going to take a little break here in a minute. Does anybody have any questions? Is there any information up here? Anybody learn anything? Huh? Okay, we're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to come back, okay?